All right. Welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast. I am your host, Cameron Tuptabai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. Thanks again for stopping by. We wanted to today just discuss possible lineups that may or may not be featured by the Boston Celtics this upcoming season. But Sean Sharania, Josiah, and Kevin Durant had other plans. So we're going to start with a little bit of news. And then in the second half of the podcast, in the lab portion of the programming, we are going to look at different lineups that Ime Doka and the Boston Celtics may or may not choose to use. Alex, how are you? I'm doing well. You know, I'm excited for our next game tonight, Cam. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. After my one-week hiatus, I'm back on the court and uh, excited to gut out another victory. Cool. Dr. Quinn? Not too shabby. Now I'm really enjoying the dead period of the news. Mm. Well, I thought we were going to be enjoying really, really no news. And I think most of the NBA is on it's vacation. Fun. Yeah. Oh, good segue. Okay, so in the interest of no news, we've retreated to some stuff. Uh, Kevin Durant and Joe Tsai met, I believe it was in London, to talk about Kevin Durant's uh, future. And according to reporting from The Athletic and Shams Tarania, Kevin Durant reiterated his trade demand, saying that he needs to go, or general manager Sean Marks and head coach Steve Nash need to go. A few hours later, Joe Tsai made it clear that he is supporting the front office by way of Twitter. Um, Shams also mentioned that Boston, Miami, and Toronto remain leading candidates, but that Brooklyn would take every last asset from a possible trade partner. So, Dr. Quinn, I'll go to you. Um, You're suggesting that this is no news. Why isn't this a big deal? Well, I mean, this is huge news if you are a Nets fan, but if you are, I'm confused why you're watching this podcast. I'd love to have you. Don't get me wrong, but it's not exactly the nexus of Nets news. So, uh, from the Celtics' perspective, if you read very carefully the report from Shams, he says leading candidates does not mention anything about any new news or any new sourcing of any kind that really pulls the Celtics in more. And things are looking increasingly desperate, for at least from where I sit, based on what's going on. And you can come up with a viable argument over who might have leaked this from on both sides, but whatever, whatever is going on, people are increasingly agitating to get something done, and it's looking increasingly like they are caring less about what happens and more about the fact that it does happen. Okay. Alex, anything about this latest instance of come direct trade chatter that uh, you're chewing the fat on? I mean, the only thing that kind of stood out from the athletic article to me was um, kind of at the end, they mentioned uh, Durant's existing relationship with Ime Udoka, the Celtics head coach. I don't know that that's particularly newsworthy so much as to me, it suggests at least that somebody is interested in kind of positioning the Celtics as being, at least from a narrative standpoint, probably the most serious threat to trade for Durant and leverage that relationship in the writing to make it seem that way. Again, I don't know if that actually matters a whole lot from the sense I get, I I, I wouldn't be shocked, for example, if Udoka has some interest in kicking the tires on that. He knows KD pretty well from both team USA and as an assistant with the Brooklyn Nets. At the same time, there's nothing in the article or in the latest series of events that's really newsworthy specifically for the Celtics. For the Nets, there's plenty to chew on, but for the Celtics specifically, the status quo is kind of the same. Also, I think it's important to note that if you were in the Celtics front office and there was a guy who was trying to get his current bosses fired, it might mm-hmm. you know take a little shine off of the interest, at least in my opinion. Yeah, last time uh, we talked about Kevin Durant with uh, Mark Murphy, we kind of talked about who this type of reporting is for and where it comes from. And it's enough um, rumor and guesswork that I'm really not going to get in the weeds too much, but I would hazard that this reporting is coming from Durant's side of the table. Um, So Alex, to that end, I actually wonder if that means Durant would like to play for Boston Celtics first and foremost. Um, or sees that as the most likely pathway to being traded to a contender. I think Um, we would know about it if that was the case. That's just my perspective. Yeah, or or he's flirting with it. I mean, the addition of, there's a whole paragraph in a 500-word athletic post about Durant's relationship with Doka. Nothing about his relationship with Toronto or Miami. Perhaps there isn't much of a relationship. 
Um, so if people are bored and want to play um, with NBA tarot cards, um, I, I do think that, that that's an interesting frame, Alex. Um, I also think that the Rudy Gobert um, trade really messed up the trade market. And uh, so Danny Ainge, in some small way, maybe is the reason this is all being held up because it's reasonable to want the world for ostensibly a leading MVP candidate next season and someone who has four years left under contract. Um, but the Nets seem pretty stubborn about their asking price, um, perhaps because they saw that Rudy Gobert went for um, quite a ransom. Anything else knocking around in your head? I know that we've flirted. I mean, Justin, I'll, I'll kind of, I think, put words in your mouth, which is as much as it's fun to uh, dream up trade packages and things like this, ultimately you're just playing into the hands of the NBA media market and then also uh, some of the players um, in the Brooklyn front office or sideline. So it's we, we've been daydreaming perhaps about possible trades or lack thereof, but that's exactly the point of this kind of reporting. So I think we'll move on. There is one thing that also I think that's worth mentioning, which is that in the current iteration of the Durant possible trade teams, um, the three teams that were listed in the latest round were all Eastern Conference teams. I do think that's at least minorly of note because one of the possible reasons that the Celtics might be interested in a Durant trade is as a kind of arms race trade, as a way to prevent a Miami or a Philly or a Toronto yeah. from acquiring Kevin Durant. Um, I don't think that they are super concerned about that. Again, they just made the finals and probably got better over the off season. So I don't think that's an ultra pressing concern, but it's at least something to be monitored. Okay. A couple other things about news. It's August. So this could change. We've got training camp. We've got preseason, but steeple pet is reporting that Al Horford is expected to sit back to backs. Um, I wrote about this lineup thing that we're going to talk about today. I kind of talked about, Hey, Al Horford deserves to start. And until he says, otherwise he, he looks like a uh, spring chicken. So, um, what do you think, Alex, of the, the news that Horford reportedly will sit on the second night of back-to-backs? I'm not surprised. I, I think multiple sources over the course of the offseason have indicated that that's the Celtics' plan. And I don't think that the Celtics would be going forward with it if Horford was not also aware and on board. I think he was pretty visibly gassed by the end of the finals last season, despite having, I thought, a really stellar playoff run. He played a ton of minutes and he played a ton of high leverage minutes. Horford was, by all accounts through the stats, one of the 10 most impactful defenders in basketball and was pretty critical for everything that the Celtics did on their playoff run last year. He's also 36. So I think it's understandable that they might want to keep him on ice for the regular season as much as possible. I get that he wants to start and he has earned the right to maintain his status as a starter. And I think he will start in the games that he's playing, but I do think it makes sense to sit him on back to backs and make sure that he's primed and ready to go for the playoffs as much as possible. How many back to backs do you get in a year? Like 10? Mm, a little bit more. Usually like a dozen to a dozen, 20. Yeah. 20. Wow. That'd be a huge number. It really okay, depends. Just... And with COVID, we could see more, more just because of the, the home of the way series that, that teams are doing that to kind of minimize yeah. travel. Which I do like. Um, Justin, anything Alex missed about Horford sitting? I mean, you could save it for when we talk about the lineups. Uh, well, hopefully we'll be talking with Anna pretty soon to, to pick her mind about what she thinks he'll react to that with. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I think it's both the right idea uh, and also something that I'm, I'm wondering how it's going to be taken. We can discuss that a little bit more in the lab portion of the programming. But I mean, you know, in previous shows, and I think in a little bit, we, we've mentioned previously how there could be some forces colliding. I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay. I mean, if you guarantee that $28 million contract or whatever it is, that's what they end up playing. Uh, also, in the Al Horford news segment of the programming, uh, he just posted on Instagram about a court they needed down in the Dominican Republic. Um, it's a court, it's a facility, it's, it's part of a broader 75th anniversary NBA CARES initiative where they leave it um, several dozen courts, several in uh, Latin America alone. Um, so he posted a nice video. It seems like he's got family involved. Um, seems like it's a, a really nice facility that they made 
Um, I wrote about it on Solid Inspire if you want to learn more about that. And um, hopefully we'll talk to, if not Anna Horford, someone in the know about that project and all things Horford and all things uh, Horford family, I suppose. Um, speaking of hoops in Spanish speaking countries, Mexico City games are back. Dr. Quinn, this is, this is your lane. Tell us everything. Well, I also want to mention one of those courts that you were describing is also here in La Alameda, excuse me, Park here in Mexico City. It's uh, got the Loteria on it, the lottery game, which you, you, for those of you who are not familiar, is a big Latin American tradition. I like how each of these courts has its own locally focused kind of a thing. Uh, I think the Dominican Republic one has like a, um, a carnival uh, masked yeah. uh, basketball. And a local game. artist, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, but as far as the Mexico City games go, I'm really, really psyched. Uh, I'm hoping that my vaccination card is going to get me in the tour. I'm not sure how that's going to go. We we have um, a little bit slower vaccination rates here. We, we, we are you know embracing just as enthusiastically here, but there is that going on. We have no idea how international travel, COVID surges, and all that fun stuff go will go on. But fingers crossed, I will see the Miami Heat take on. Uh, the San Antonio Spurs, not quite as exciting, but hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to maybe Romeo Langford or uh, uh, Mr. Uh, J. Rich. Yeah, uh, I saw someone say that uh, DeJounte Murray, who has just been lighting the world on fire, he finally got out of the NBA private school, referring to the, the Spurs. Maybe you can talk to Spurs people about that off the record because that take is hilarious to me. Um, okay, uh, a few more things in the web news, and then we will do this lineup thing. Grant Williams uh, claims that he and Steph were joking around uh, at the SBs and then back online. He talked to Brian Kobrowski on uh, the For the Win podcast. Grant been very busy this summer. Uh, that's a good listen, but just following him on Instagram. He's up to all sorts of stuff. Um, and Tremont Waters is playing for the Greater Hartford, or Hartford Pro Am. Um, so if you need more Tremont Waters in your life and you live in New England, check that out. Okay. We have something fun to do, which is we're going to hop in the Celtics lab. And suddenly the Celtics have great depth. Um, it was at one point last season where a joke I said, uh, my rotation is eight people, maybe seven people, and that's what we've got. We're going to run with it. Um, and now suddenly maybe there's a few too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, the addition of Gallinari, the trade, line, uh, trade deadline addition of Derek White, the addition of Malcolm Brogdon, Luke Cornett, Sam Hauser. There's a lot of bodies who can um, conceivably earn real NBA per. Um, so it's a, it's a different shape than last season, all things considered. Um, we are assuming that this is designed for rest um, and that this is designed for flexibility. But Dr. Quinn, you kind of teased that uh, it could be a little harder to navigate. Um, tell us more about that thought. Well, we have two players that we have discussed previously who are looking at, you know, arguably the biggest, not arguably, actually the largest uh, NBA deals in history if they hit certain benchmarks like all NBA. And with that in mind, that being Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who could make uh, close to $300 million in their next contract. Uh, so, you know, they might want to make sure they put up the numbers to get there because some kind of money would be at stake. And if they are playing, you know, 30 minutes or less per game, that could be hard to do. Yeah, uh, I think for Jalen, I don't know, Jason Summers, it's a difference of almost $60 million over the course of a four or five year extension. Um, so it matters big time. Um, and the flip side of that coin is, you know, if you're uh, Grant Williams in a contract here or Peyton Pritchard in year with three or four in the NBA, you're probably not happy playing eight minutes. You probably want to get more burn. So it might not be the big dogs who want all the minutes, maybe the small dogs, I guess, uh, who just want some more action. Um, Alex, what are your thoughts on this now crowded uh, Celtics rotation? Well, I think the big thought that I have in the crowded Celtics rotation is that the two guys that they brought in in Malcolm Brogdon and Danilo Gallinari are both vets who are excited to join the Celtics specifically because they want a shot at winning a title and who also have struggled with some of their own injury woes in the past. So I'm a little bit less concerned about that just based around the idea that those guys, I'm sure they will want to play minutes, obviously, and they will want to contribute in a meaningful sense. And you should, you're not paying Malcolm Brogdon, you know, 
$22 million to sit around and do nothing. But at the same time, I think both of those guys have come into this with an understanding that their minutes might fluctuate a little bit depending on who's available and that there's going to be times when they're going to play more, they're going to play less, and where some of the young guys, your Peyton Pritchards or your Grant Williams, might have to get a little extra burn, particularly given the contract incentive, incentives for those guys. Um, obviously, vets are prideful. They want to play and they want to be given a certain level of respect, which Brogdon and Gallo have both earned over the course of their careers. But I'm, I'm not horribly worried about, like, for example, conflict in the locker room coming out of the minutes uh, heading into the season. This team knows who's going to be starting when everybody's healthy. This team knows who's going to be coming off the bench, who's going to be in a high leverage role, and who's not going to be as much. And I think as long as Yudoka and everybody else are on the same page, that the minutes is allocated the way it is to give the Celtics the best shot that they have at winning a title, I think that's going to be fine. I would hop in and say, interestingly, um, I'm curious about who starts for, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, obviously, um, starts for Horford when he sits, um, because if Tatum slides to the four, hello, Malcolm Brogdon, six man of the year. If Tatum stays at the three, hello, Grant Williams, six man of the year. Um, just because there's going to be, as we've established, between 10 and 20 games that uh, Al Horford might be sitting in the second night of back-to-backs for uh, six or seventh man to become a starter. So um, I don't know that that's conflict, but it occurs to me that it's very interesting baked in opportunity for the Celtics to field a true sixth man of the year uh, candidate. All right, here's how this is not a game. No one's going to win, or at least uh, I already have this in the bag. Um, here's what we're going to do. We have a few scenarios, so to speak, um, where we've cooked up the ideal lineups uh, or the lineups we suspect might be the ideal lineups. Um, those are the starters, the closers, the defense, the best shooting lineup, uh, the funkiest, and perhaps if we don't get to a miscellaneous or something that we just want to see. Um, so we'll break down those different lineups. I'm sure there will be redundancies. So you won't hear each one of us offer ours again and again and again. Um, at the end, we will talk about perhaps what the rotation looks like by way of minutes um, and then what we learned along the way. So. Alex, I'm going to go to you first. Give us your 2022-23 Boston Celtics starting lineup, and Justin and I will tell us tell you if we uh, missed anything. You missed anything. Yeah, so the Boston Celtics are going to start opening night and most of their games with the following combination. It's going to be Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown in the backcourt. The frontcourt is going to be Jason Tatum, Al Horford, and Robert Williams. That's going to be your standard starting lineup in most situations. That's going to be their starting lineup in the playoffs. That's going to be their starting lineup on opening night, et cetera, et cetera. We have mentioned that Al Horford is going to rest on back-to-backs. If that is the case, or if Al Horford has to sit for any other wear and tear reasons, the logical starter to plug into that lineup is going to be Grant Williams, who I think fits the Celtics' identity of having a switchable defense on the floor at all times, and particularly uh, continuing to have some size on the floor at all times, which Yudoka has openly stated is his preferred method of playing. So it's Horford on most nights. And when it's not Horford, it's going to be Grant Williams. The remaining starters will be the same. I don't have too much to add to that other than this exercise made me realize just how many different ways they could plug a hole like that with this, this roster. So, I mean, if they want to go with experience uh, and keep him in a more limited role, Gallinari could probably still start on occasion at the four. Uh, yeah. If they want to go a little smaller, I mean, we could talk about this all day long, but I mean, like introducing either Derek White or Malcolm Brogdon into the, into the lineup, uh, very, very easy ways. I mean, if you want to give a boost in minutes to Peyton Pritchard, voila. I mean, there's so many ways you can turn. Yeah, if the... The big man rotation, Luke Burnett, uh, Kevin Jelle, um, Noah Vonley, if that doesn't really pan out, then Alex, maybe Grant has to come off the bench when Horford is, is not playing um, just to strengthen the big man rotation. Um, I'm interested in Gallo. Um, and I learned today that Malcolm Brogdon is 6'5", not known to be a great defender, but he has a 6'10 wingspan. Um, so that dude could play the three if Jason Tatum can play the four, which uh, I would strongly suggest he could. But 
uh, Alex is right, the starters almost definitely on day one and into the postseason and beyond. Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Al Horford, Robert Williams. It ain't broke. Nothing affects. Okay, Dr. Quinn, I will go to you. What lineup closes games for the Boston Celtics? Uh, Probably more often than not, identical uh, with maybe Derek White coming in uh, on nights where somebody is out. And I say somebody because it could be almost anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex, who I closes think, games? I think it's going to be likely on, on nights when Horford in the regular starting lineup is intact, it will be the same. I'm, a, I'm not so sure. I think for the small closing lineup, there is a real possibility that Malcolm Brogdon could be in that closing lineup with Marcus Smart Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Al Horford at center. Um, I think it's obviously matchup dependent, but one of the things that I think the Celtics kind of realize going further and further into the playoffs, and particularly in going up against Golden State, is that while Robert Williams is an extremely good perimeter defender for his size, there are still some moments where teams, particularly teams that play a spaced out smaller style, can drag Williams out to the perimeter. And if he's at all health compromised, it becomes challenging for him to get into play and impact it in the way that he would like to. In that situation, that's exactly why you have Malcolm Brogdon in, both to come in and get stops on the perimeter, but also to give the Celtics the offensive juice that they sorely lack in their closing lineups uh, for the regular season and for the playoffs last year. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some situations where Brogdon and Smart are the backcourt and Horford moves to the center position. I would go a step further. I hope that that's how they close games. Um, With respect to Rob Williams, he's not a shooter. Not a great free throw shooter, not a bad free throw shooter. Um, And yes, he's a defensive free safety and it's miraculous, but um, I think Smart, Brogdon, Brown, Tatum, and Horford as a closing lineup gives them offensive looks that they just didn't have in the postseason. Uh, Against the Warriors, yes, Steph Curry went supernova and shout out to him, but Boston didn't have an offense and having one fewer uh, big man and one more ball handler creates space and creates that Spurs East thing. I want to see, I mean, if you really want to go Spurs East, you can put Dark White in. Um, but I think, I think Brogdon is, is the move there. Um, so with respect to Rob Williams, unless, uh, and I wrote about this on Celtics wire, unless the Celtics are just getting hammered inside and it's Giannis all the way or that Andre Drummond game that's definitely coming. It's going to be a bother. Um, I go smaller, not the smallest, but smaller down the stretch. And th- this is unnecessary, but if Robert Williams is sore about that, Al Horford will be in a truncated role next season, I assume. Uh, and Robert Williams can close out games next season. He's on a long contract. I don't think you need to worry too much about him being upset that he's on the pines for the closing minutes of games. Um, and then when Horford sits, he can replace Horford, I suppose. I think the the utterance earlier uh, of Alex of matchup dependent is going to be a very critical word in almost everything we talk about today. So, yeah, yeah. Um, also, who knows what the Easter Conference is going to look like? And again, Kevin Durant could be traded any minute now. And let's just throw this out. Okay, let's go, uh, Dr. Brown. I'll go back to you first. Uh, the best defensive lineup the Celtics can throw out there: generic defensive, not hyper you know, sensitive to one opponent, we'll say. Absolutely. So I actually have two. Uh, The big defensive lineup is basically just the starters, right? It's the core focus of this team. I don't expect it to change. They added people to extend the bench depth, not to really change fundamentally how the team operates. So the the defensive lineup is the lineup, right? It's the starting Mm -hmm. lineup. But uh, they can also go small, Marcus Smart, uh, Derek White, Jalen, Grant Williams, and Robert Williams for a more defensive but smaller lineup. Sure. Alex, what is your uh, all Celtics, all defense team? Listen, if you're trying to get stops, the Celtics have a lineup that I am incredibly excited about heading into this year. And it's a lineup that we've already seen a good bit of. Marcus Smart, Derek White, Jason Tatum, Al Horford, Robert Williams. That is just a gauntlet to try and score on that team. Could get a little clunky offensively with Marcus Smart and Derek White in the lineup at the same time. But this is the lineup you deploy when you absolutely need to get a stop. And man, that's an exciting lineup up there. 
Yeah, I like, uh, I'm going to continue that thread. I'm willing to put Jalen Brown on the bench for this one, um, just because a few times he got cooked and overextended in the postseason that looms large in my mind. So I would go smart, Brown or Derek White there at the two guard. Tatum, check me out. I'm going to go Grant Williams, Robert Williams. Um, Grant's individual defense against Kevin Durant and Giannis um, was really spectacular. And as much as the Celtics are going to switch everything, I assume, next season as well, the ability for uh, you, your uh, front court player to switch on to Kevin Durant and really give him the business, Al Horford can still do that, but not with the same speed, I don't think. Um, so for my defensive team, I'm going, I'll go smart, white, Tatum, G. Will, R. Will. Um, but as we will say at nauseum, uh, this is an embarrassment of riches because we could have also had Jalen Brown and Al Horford in this lineup. Um, so pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. No, no slight to Jalen on the Derek white inclusion. I think Jalen Brown is a very good defender, but the advanced metrics bear out that Derek white was one of the most impactful perimeter defenders in the league last year. And I don't see that not continuing. And he's a little bit bigger. Um, a little bit longer, not by much, but um, I think he's an inch shorter, but his wingspan's a little bit longer, so that, that could be helpful. Okay, Alex, I'll stick with you. Sure. Your Celtics, the best shooting lineup Iman Doka can reasonably put out there. I can't Another five Luke Cornets, um, but <laughs> I, 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 as you know, I'm a big Luke Cornet guy, and that would be a fun time for me. But I do think this lineup is another one that I'm really excited about seeing, and I think if you want to just go balls to the wall, complete shooting, don't care about defense at all, just run teams out of the building, this would be a fun lineup to throw out there. Malcolm Brogdon at the point, Peyton Pritchard at the two-guard position, Jason Tatum at the three, Danilo Gallinari at the four, and Grant Williams at the five. Like, if we're trying to get shots up, that is the line that will, that's a lineup that will get shots up at a crazy level. Every single one of those dudes is a legit dead eye like Malcolm Brogdon and Grant Williams are by percentage points two of the best corner three shooters of like the past five years this would be a crazy lineup and it's like totally conceivable it's not no offense Sam Hauser but it's not you know you're not digging deep into the rotation for this okay Dr. Quinn what is your do you have Sam Hauser in your shooting line? <laughs> uh, no I don't no apologies to Sam uh, I just need to see him on the floor uh, I penciled him in around six minutes a game I mean, I think it's either six or eight minutes per game, which I think is even being generous based on what we've seen from him so far. I do think he'll get there, maybe even by the end of the season, but he, he might need another season of that guaranteed contract to actually get on the floor. My shooting lineup was a little bit more balanced, uh, but one of the things that struck me was how, again, plausible some of these lineups are. Uh, I had Brogdon, Pritchard, Brown, Tatum, and Horford. Uh, I almost went with Luke Cornett at the five, but I mean, even though his percentage is a little bit higher, uh, if I'm going to trust him in an actual serious game time thing, I'm still thinking that I'm leaning Al for now. Sure. Um so I, I, again, I'll just keep moving the product. I wrote about this on Celtics Wire. It's either up or it'll be up soon enough so you could read about why I, I did this. But um, I'm not going to include Brogdon. He didn't have a good shooting year next year. So sorry, Malcolm. Um, oh, wait. Sorry. Pause the action. We have to talk about Malcolm Brogdon's nicknames. I'll do that at the end. Uh, just flabbergasted by the, the best nicknames in the NBA belonging to Malcolm Brogdon this whole time. Anyways. My shooting lineup does not include Malcolm Brogdon. It includes, at the point, Peyton Pritchard, um, who shot, I believe, 41.2% from three in the regular season. Jalen Brown, a pretty good three-point shooter. Also, uh, I took him off the defense team, so he can have this one. Jason Tatum, also a very good three-point shooter. Grant Williams shot 41.1% from three uh, during the regular season. Alex, to your point, like, perhaps the best corner three specialist in the NBA. And I am sorry that Al Horford shot 48% from three in the postseason. He is the captain of the shooting team until he proves otherwise. He went big poppy 2013 playoffs for us last year. Um, so he gets I to- see, I see the, how you favor Al for, for, you know, recency bias on shooting, but Malcolm, he just gets. The, the, the... <laughs> no, I'm favoring recency bias. No, no, no. He, you're, you're absolutely he's... right. I'm just yeah. giving out time. Malcolm shot 30% from three last season. I don't really want to talk about that. Um, Malcolm, okay. was, Malcolm shot 30% from three as the best three-point shooter on the Indiana Pacers team that featured almost nobody who could hit an outside shot. Come on. Good point. Well argued. All right. Well, 
<laughs> we'll see in the fall. Um, okay, speaking of Malcolm Brogdon, just as you said it, I'm going to pause the action very selfishly. I didn't ask Justin or Alex if I could do this. I, in writing my article, went on Basketball Reference where they list nicknames, and these were all listed as Malcolm Brogdon nicknames. Humble Moses, the president, Uncle Malcolm, and Mookie Doo, spelled D-E-W, which is what his dad used to call him, which is super cute. Um, so, yeah, Justin, I know AP Style doesn't love using nicknames, but I'm going to fight you on that all season long, right? No, do it. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll miss them in my editing. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. It's so, a Jewish guy. I am really excited about having a player that I can call humble Moses on the team. <laughs> Which is kind of a cheap shot at regular Moses. It kind of implies that regular Moses wasn't humble. Um, regular Moses. I mean, man, it's moments of not being so humble. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for all the Moses stands out there, sorry. Okay. Uh, Not Moses, great guy. <laughs> we are going to talk about our kind of minute breakdown in a moment and what we learned about this exercise, which we've kind of teased as, man, the Celtics are good. Any miscellaneous lineups that either of you want to offer, either a specialty situation that you want to shout out or just one that you want to see? Um, I have one that I'm going to offer, but either of you want to hop in with a lineup that you want to you- see? Yeah. You, you go first, Cam. Yeah, you okay. go first. I bet, I bet you know what I'm about to say. Uh, my guy, Humble Moses, despite his three-point shooting at the point. Uh, 38% Brown, nearly career three-point yeah. shooters. He shot like 42% a couple years ago. I mean, he, he can you know, shoot the three. Um, Brogdon, Brown, Tatum at the three. Carmelo Anthony at the four. And Kurt Williams at the five. <laughs> you need to be scotch. I shouldn't have let you do this. <laughs> I should have been sipping a beverage. And this, yeah, and the scenario is that's the <laughs> closing lineup uh, for the for the finals. That, wow, the Celtics win Banner eighteen. Okay. Okay. I have, a ran- <laughs> I have a miscellaneous lineup that uh, features players that are actually on the Boston Celtics uh-huh. exclusively: Peyton Pritchard, Malcolm Brogdon, Derek White, Grant Williams, Danilo Gallinari. Why not just go ultra small, get out and run every possession, Gallo at center? Why not? Let's try it. Defense? No. Try it for three minutes at a time. The second night of a back to back against like the Hornets, though, that's like, that's an amazing lineup. All right. So these are my funkiest lineups. Are we doing funkiest as miscellaneous or just kind of whatever? Okay. So I have, I have two that I came up with. I'll go backwards first. I'll start with a law firm lineup, which is Brogdon, Brown, White, Williams, and Williams, just because it sounds like a law firm. It's the only yeah. logic. <laughs> uh, no other real thought put into that. And then besides that, the tall ball lineup, where nobody is below six foot five with Brogdon at the point, JB and JT on the wing, Gallo and Cornet in the front court. Amazing. Yeah, that Gallo wild, or that, uh, yeah, that wild card is interesting to me. Because if he's... If he's as good as he's been in recent years in smaller stints, uh, that really changes things in my mind. If not, we're going to loop point out, I suppose. I have another funky lineup to throw in there as well. This is the switch everything all the time small ball lineup with Malcolm Brogdon, Marcus Smart, Derek White, Jason Tatum at the four, and Grant Williams at the five. Like, if you want to just be sprinting around the perimeter and shutting down, like, a Steph Curry type, making sure that there's literally nowhere that they can attack from outside, that is a lineup that will have the speed to cover all of those positions at a really high level. I love that. Okay. Um, I think this is the way that I'm going to present this. And I'll go slowly enough, Alex and Justin, that you can stop me if you want to explain anything. But in coming up with these rotations, we... Uh, didn't I didn't want to see. Oh, that was my Carmelo Anthony. Yeah, okay, what's the lineup that you most want to see? JQ, you got it. Death from above is what I call it, because everybody has a death lineup, but uh, Brogdon, JB, JT, Gallo, and Cornette, which is basically just a super tall, super shooty lineup. And if, um, yeah, if Gallo and Cornette can hang on defense, that's not bad. I don't think they can, but we'll see. We'll see. I have another lineup that I am pretty interested in seeing, and this is the everybody is big and can shoot lineup. Malcolm Brogdon, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Danilo Gallinari, Al Horford. It's just a bunch of very big dudes who can shoot, and you can't block them because they're all very tall. I'm really interested in seeing that. It's like the Thunder a few years ago, or the Raptors. Okay. Uh, So what we will do now is we estimated how many minutes roughly 
across like all of these lineups and all of the averages, how many minutes players will play um, by way of a regular season rotation. And we're just kind of assuming Al Horford is playing these games, although uh, looking at my number, maybe it's a little too high. So I'm going to go player by player and give the range of minutes that we think they'll play in the rotation, which by training camp could be all wrong, but we'll see. Anyways, uh, Marcus Smart, we have playing between 26 and 30 minutes, which I suppose is a big number, a big range, but um, those are starters minutes. I mean, we haven't talked much about Marcus Smart, but he's not going anywhere. Jalen Brown between 26 and 32 minutes. Jason Tatum, same exact number. Um, so somewhere between lightened load and still relatively low numbers for starters, even 32 uh, for young starters in the NBA. It's not, not crazy. Um, Al Horford, a lot of range. Uh, Justin and Alex, you have him between 22 and 24 minutes. I put him up at 30 um, with the idea that he's going to get a lot of rest, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's much more reduced so long as the big man rotation can hold up. Um, I do have a caveat to that, which is that I think Al Horford's regular season minutes are going to be right. low, but his playoff minutes will spike back to around 30. So, yeah, this is a regular season exercise. I mean, I think we know that the rotation will shrink considerably in the, in the, the offs. Um, Robert Williams, if his knees allow, we have him between 26 and 28 minutes, um, which is a bigger number than he has been playing, but I guess we're bullish on that. Um, Brogdon between 16 and 24 minutes. I, I was stingier with minutes. So I, that's that big number is coming from me. Um, I, I didn't give the bench many minutes. Um, where are we? Okay. Uh, then we got Danilo Gallinari between, uh, oh, I went, I went very different than you guys. You guys have about 18 and 16 minutes respectively. I have them at nine minutes to, you know, four and a half minutes stints per half. Um, but as we, as we said, if he's, you know, a featured power forward, that could, that could really change. Justin and I are also factoring in that Horford is going to play a great deal fewer minutes in the regular season. And that's where Gallo is going to mop up a lot. He's also going to be doing a lot of duty playing mostly up and some down as well. So he'll be getting some stuff outside of the forward position, I think as well. Sure. So uh, we have Grant between 21 and 24 minutes. I think we all see him as that six, six and a half man. Um, fast PP between 10 and 14 minutes. That might go down in the playoffs, says Alex. Uh, actually, I'm curious. How much, what was his playing time last season? I think it was less than that. I had know. it pulled up while I was doing this exercise. I think what it was professional around, venture this is. I, I think it was around 12-ish, 12, 13, actually. Okay. Um, but Luke, you have Luke. to also factor in that at a certain point last year, kind of after the Derek White trade, when the Celtics consolidated players and yeah. kicked Dennis Schroeder to the curb, he had a pretty significant increase from at the beginning of the season where he was barely playing at all. 14.1 minutes per game. Uh, might be jumping ahead of ourselves here, but I, I just wanted to mention that that is roughly what we are projecting him to have, maybe a slight decrease among the more pessimistic of us. And that means, at least to me, that concerns over his playing time are at least a little bit overblown. Maybe. I mean, you got to, we're bringing in two rotation guys into the fold. Um, I actually disagree. I mean, he got 14 minutes on an eight-man rotation, uh, maybe nine-man rotation. He's the ninth man. Because um, we have Derek White with between 14 and 20 minutes. Um, so I don't know. I mean, our math adds up. <laughs> That's the important um, part. One thing that I think we also might want to consider as far as Peyton Pritchard's minutes go is that I think there is a reasonable possibility that the Celtics are going to try and showcase him a little bit leading up to the trade deadline. We'll see. Ooh, Alex, friend Alex, that was good. Okay, um, Luke Cornett, we have, you know, 32, 34, no, uh, six, six and seven minutes for Mr. Cornett. Um, Sam, don't call me Doogie Hauser. 10 minutes for the doctor, three minutes for Alex, no minutes for Cameron. Sorry, Sam. And uh, the third center. You're going to give him minutes. They didn't just sign him to a contract and not play the man. Goodness. Anyway. I mean, yeah. In the, so what I did was uh, I'll, I'll pull up the name of the tool in a second. Um, There's a slider where you could plug and play things. So this was my idealized minute breakdown one game, not 82 games. So in reality, uh, shave a few things off. And of course, Sam Hauser is going to see the court. But I don't think for... I mean, I actually don't think 10 minutes more than a handful of times. I mean, maybe the average nets, but the, the mode, I think, will be much, much lower. Um, and to that end, the third center, total wild card for me. Um, Justin, you have as high as eight minutes. Alex, low as three. 
you could tell me 20 minutes depending on you know where Robert Williams is at. So that one's I think the biggest we might have very new there. Also on Luke Cornett and how he does. They seem to be pretty enthusiastic about what he can do for them from all accounts. But I mean he's got to be able to, to fill those minutes. So it could go up, it could go down, depending on him. I mean, it also depends on who the third center is for the Celtics or fourth center, I guess, in this case. Like, if you consider Al Horford a four or five hybrid, if, you know, it's young, fresh legs, Kevin Gale, he could be playing like 15 minutes. If it's like Noah Vonley on his last legs as an NBA player, maybe a little bit less, we'll see. So... If, if folks are still with us, first of all, like and subscribe, yada, yada. Um, second of all, thanks for listening to a podcast where we said numbers at you. Um, and we're going to talk about what we learned about this exercise. And um, I learned that it's not great podcast and just tell numbers at people. Um, Justin, what, I have another thing I'd like to say, but I'm going to go. I'll let you go first, Justin. Just in this process of exploring this maybe messy rotation situation, what did you learn? Well, again, just to, to circle back to, to Fast PP, I don't think that he's going to be out of the rotation, which was kind of what some people were suggesting might end up happening. He probably should be getting more minutes, right, based on the steps he made last season, based on what we saw from him in the postseason. But he's not going to. But he's probably not going to lose very much if he does even lose any minutes. And when you factor in guys taking nights off on occasion, he may end up finding more minutes that way moving around the roster. But also we kind of touched on this just a second ago with the, with the big men, depending on how things pan out, even if they don't pan out super well, I, I do think that you can expand Grant's role. You can, if Cornette ends up playing really well, expand his role. If one of these other guys works out, if multiple guys are particularly interesting, they have their roster spots. I mean, they have three unfilled right now that we aren't even like, you know, figuring into this exercise. Uh, so, I, <laughs> I mean, beyond third, big man yeah, yeah. without a name no, i mean carmelo uh, anthony yeah no seriously well stop anyway <laughs> you get my point so yeah, to sum up the third big man problem is really not a very big one it's probably something that they're going to want to address by by the the trade deadline if they haven't found their guy for sure on the roster and they probably aren't going to uh they're probably going to want to trade for someone who will but i mean that's not really a major problem alex uh in this experience what did what did you uncover in discovery um i uncovered two things the first thing is that the celtics are going to probably repeat as being a top two defense this year if everybody stays healthy this team is just absolutely loaded stock to the gills with really really good defensive players Peyton Pritchard and Danilo Gallinari are the two weakest defenders that are going to get rotation minutes. Peyton Pritchard fights. He's not an awful defender. And Gallinari is not a great defender, but he's big. You know, he can kind of get in the way. And every other dude ahead of them in the defensive hierarchy is genuinely either very good to legitimately great. So once again, Ime Udoka is going to be bringing back the lead pipe Celtics to clobber teams into the ground. The other thing that I learned is related to Justin's point about the third big spot. I think that it's probably fair to say that the Celtics have enough to get to February with their current big rotation. I also think that the way that the minutes and the rotations are structured right now, they are going to be a prime spot for buyout candidates at the market. And I'm not even sure that they will necessarily need to make a trade at the trade deadline if they are winning, if they are in a position to make a title run, and if there are teams that are shedding bigs for salary purposes as it becomes clear that they are not going to be competitive that year, the Celtics are going to be a logical buyout landing spot for a ton of available candidates. The market favors the Celtics. Uh, well, Alex, to your point, we'll give you a six weeks plus of trade deadline content here at the Celtics Live podcast. And bundling Derek White, Grant Williams, and Danilo Gallinari gets you a big chunk of salary. So uh, the Celtics don't need to be players in any sort of trade scenario, but they, they have the pieces if they want to. Um, to that end, the things that I uncovered is either the Celtics still win like 66 games because they are so damn deep and so flexible or they're going to win like 54 because they're going to take their time they're going to make sure everybody eats and they're not going to be laser focused on every regular season game so um, there's a world where these are young 
Young Bucks uh, outside of Milwaukee, obviously, um, roll the ball out and see what happens, or this is a team that just went to the finals, they know what they're doing, and it's a marathon last sprint. Um, There's yes, one uh, other uh, observation that I came across in learning and thinking about this lineup, which is that the Celtics do not need to trade for Kevin Durant to win the title this year. Hell yes! <laughs> uh, well, a related thought is... This might be the most, the least we've talked about Marcus Smart on a podcast, and yet Marcus Smart is going to be so central to what the Celtics do. So um, take that with a grain of salt. We didn't make the Isn't shooting that team. Kind of nice though, like to yeah. know, go into this season knowing like Marcus is a locked in starting point guard who won Defensive Player of the Year, and that's not going to change. That's for me. That's a really refreshing feeling to mm-hmm. have to, as opposed to previous years, just be like, what are we going to do with Marcus Smart, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, like, no, this year, the Boston Celtics know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Marcus Smart is the starting point guard. It is not an interesting question anymore. Grant doesn't mean this lingering question. And even that seems like it's going to get resolved. It might not get resolved at a super palatable price, but probably. What is? Grant's uh, contract extension. Right. Is a looming issue. Uh, yeah. I can't wait for Dean and time. Grant Williams playing a contract here. Amazing. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, please, please do like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't, leave us a review. That's that's tops. Uh, and we will, as we said, be back next week. Hopefully, talking about the Horford family. Adios.